welcome to War of the Weird, a war between friends who are striking over the discovery of the greatest chance of victory. This single battle we are about to witness has proven so powerful that by necessity it has been split into two episodes. We'll be stuck first this time in the enthralling tale of Screaming Jay Hawkins. Hello, and welcome to War of the Weirds. I'm Bruni. And I'm Mystic. And we're here, and we're telling each other strange stories that are T-R-U-E. Tra. Tra. And, <laughs> and, uh, and we're seeing who's got the weirder stories. And uh, I got a weird one today. I got a weird I one believe today. What a coincidence. Also, you do. So yeah, that's what I'm are the glad... chances? <laughs> One of these times, we're just gonna come in with a story that's just like, "Hey, I woke up, uh, ate went breakfast, to the bank. and yeah, uh, that was it. Went to the bank, uh, made a deposit. So, and guess who uh, I saw at the bank? Uh, my my neighbor who also was at the bank. Yeah, so that's it. wow, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, see how many results the bank weeks. has on Google. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but. I recently just uh, the up top banter right here. I mm-hmm. recently watched. Have you seen this film on Netflix called "I'm Thinking of Ending Things"? No, I have not. I have been off of Netflix since uh, January, but I'm getting back. Planning to get back on. I'm not <laughs> anti. I've just been like trying to read. Sounded more. like you were a Netflix addict. No, and, no, uh, no, no. Quit the habit. I want to. I want to brag real quick on myself about. So my my goal, my 2021 New Year's resolution was originally going to be to read a book a month. But then I was like, nah, I want to, I want like some books might be longer, some might be shorter. I don't want to feel like the pressure of like, I got to get this into by the 31st. So I was advised to just make it 12 books total. And this past week I finished my 13th book. So dang, I'm already done don't do anything else yeah (laughs) Yeah. so anyways i've been doing that instead of netflix so but now that i've accomplished my task my goal my other goal my other resolution is to learn how to make a fire a friction fire to learn and do it not just to learn how to do it i know how but i want to actually that's where you have a stick in your hands and you like rub the stick and spit it over Yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 there's like three different methods for like primitive fire making Mm. And so my goal is to try all of them, try and accomplish all of them by the end of the year. So, still have <laughs> yeah, those. To you're go, just but... looking at society, and you're like, "Hey, I yeah, got this. Ain't gonna this. Last. <laughs> I gotta learn this." <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna be going back to this pretty soon. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're gonna be going back to just having sticks and stones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as yeah. our main. Uh, just to break bones. Use. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, for our main objects, not for violence. Yeah. I mean, both, both are fun. Yeah. Uh, but I watched this movie. I'm thinking of ending things. Do you know who Charlie Kaufman is? I know who he is. Yeah. Yeah, he's a writer and director. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, what do you know him from? I just know the name. Oh yeah, he's a right. He he wrote Being John Malkovich. He wrote oh. an adaptation. He directed a movie called cynic docky new york and he directed and wrote this one uh and uh it's like a intense not intense it's like a weird bad dream but not a nightmare just Mm -hmm. weird and bad but it's a i think it's a great thing and it's not gonna be my spoils of war (laughs) because it's too like uh i don't know it's too thinky and dark yeah yeah but uh but yeah anybody should check it out uh if they're into sort of like art movies if Mm. you're if you're like somebody who doesn't who 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 hates the idea of watching something that might be considered self-indulgent run away from this movie (laughs) but i i kind of don't believe in self-indulgence in art that much like as a problem Mm, what do you mean? Well, people will like will be like they'll watch a movie and it's like the, the direct writer director is so self indulgent oh. that 
that implies that like they don't take into consideration the the audience has to watch this or whatever oh okay okay but it's like i don't know it's it's self-expression and if that's their if that's what they wanted to create maybe they create there's probably somebody who loves that thing that is harder to digest yeah could be construed as self-indulgent yeah yeah Hmm. yeah this movie could definitely be construed as that uh it's it's a wild uh weird bad dream feeling of a movie to watch Mm, mm -hmm. i recommend it to you mystic (laughs) okay i will check it out i was just looking up charlie kaufman and realized he did eternal sunshine of the spotless mind oh yeah that's one of my favorite movies for some reason i didn't mention it yeah. Uh, <laughs> I forgot that was him. Also, yeah. I guess because I associate it with Michelle Gondry, who directed it. Mm, yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. anyway, uh, with yeah, that out cool. of the way, that's cool. Uh, that's cool. Basically, that movie is just about the ho- the premise on Netflix. The Netflix description, I think, was like uh, a woman's uh, new boyfriend takes her to meet his parents. Except nothing is as it seems. And That's it's like so vague because like anything could happen there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, it's super fucking odd. And uh, I literally had, I literally after watching the movie, just kind of like did the dishes, <laughs> grabbed a drink, <laughs> and just sat there thinking. It's, yeah. For like, like 30 minutes. Yeah. Of like, yeah. What does everything exactly mean? That type of thing. I love that. I love that. So, like, this is not content comparison, but uh, the show Broadchurch was one of my favorite uh, mm-hmm. s- shows slash series. Haven't seen it, but I know um, vaguely of what it is. Yeah. 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 And like, there's a, an American version, but originally there's a, a like, it was on BBC. Um, mm-hmm. and I, David Tennant, I believe is in both. Um, but mm. he, yeah, he's, I mean, he's phenomenal and I watched it for him and it was so good. I ended up staying up all night watching. I watched the whole first season, uh, which is like, it's all, I mean, the second season, like obviously touches on some extensions of the first, but like the first season was like a whole complete story. Um, yeah. and it was, it's very like emotionally gripping and um it's very immersive because it's like this little small town so like you feel like you're in there um but yeah so like i stayed up all night watching the whole first season and then i remember literally i've shared the story before but like the the screen went black at the end of the final episode and then like i just saw my reflection of myself in the black screen and I looked away and like the sun was coming up through the window. And I was just like, I don't know who I am right now. Like, I don't <laughs> know. I don't know how to process everything. I just took. Who is then. this so, hideous monster? Like, <laughs> it yeah. was so like, yeah. After like 10 hours or so, something of this very like dramatic. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Like a really well-made, yeah, like it was an great. intense show. Yeah. It can can fuck you up if you yeah. if you stay with it like yeah if i watched like three episodes of breaking bad in a row when i was watching that for the first time that's such an intense experience that yeah it's just yeah like, it's exhausting after. you're like i need to like i need to laugh for a minute like i need to i need to forget <laughs> my cares yeah i need to be able to lower my shoulders yeah uh, <laughs> yeah um but, yeah cool yeah. that's all right, what you got for me today? All right, so I basically, with my choice of topic today, I have handed you the 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 win for this episode because really? I know that you know about this topic because okay. I've told you about this topic. Uh, okay. I know that this pop topic's going to have a ton of hits on Google, which is one of our <laughs> things. What's that, one of the criteria, yeah. One of the criteria for it being obscure yeah. uh, is uh, better. And yeah, so that's two out of three <laughs> determining right. factors. Uh, okay. It's, uh, I will start it off with a quote from 
this fellow. <clears throat> I came into this world black, naked, and ugly. And no matter how much I accumulate here, it's a short journey. I will go out of this world black, naked, and ugly. So I enjoy life. Hmm. That is a quote from Jay Hawkins. Jealousy Hawkins. <laughs> is this mm. ringing a bell yet? No. Jay Hawkins? No. When did you tell me about this? Uh, you'll see in a second. Okay, okay, okay. Jealousy Hawkins, uh, is his full name, was born in 1929 in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. When he was only 18th, 18 months old, he was put up for adoption. I thought you were going to say he was born when he was only 18 months old. Yeah, like, he was only 18 it. months old <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> before he was born. He was only four years old, and then <laughs> he came out of his mother's vagina. <laughs> that's how uh, birth works. Yeah, yeah. That's what I know of it. Mm-hmm. But, uh, so yeah, so he, adoption. Yeah, he got put up for adoption when he was 18 months old. He never knew anything about his father at all. Mm-hmm. Like his mother, he vaguely knew of. He probably had interactions with her ever, but his father, no idea. Mm-hmm. And pretty quickly after being put up for adoption, he was adopted. This is a uh, black baby, and he was adopted by a couple of Blackfoot Native Americans. Oh, okay. Who raised him well, according to him. Uh,. He studied classical piano as a young Mm. child Mm -hmm. and very quickly learned how to read and write music. Like, before he was five, he had the ability to read and write music. Wow, that's crazy. Um, He he aspired to become an opera singer. Mm. But as As a baby? Yeah, as a baby, he aspired, he's like, Wah, 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 wah. Goo, goo, ga, ga. Yeah, he's like, I, I can't read, but I can read music. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Next, I got my when I male soprano going before my voice changes. But yeah, no, I'm fast forwarding in time. It's oh, closer okay. to okay. Uh, to like ten, eleven <laughs> type of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, 1942. So he's born in 1929. 1942. He joined the army with a forged birth certificate because he was actually 13 years old. Oh, gracious. Okay. And he joined the army. All right. Uh, He saw combat, even though it was fairly obvious that he was too young to be there. Yeah, yeah. Um, He also entertained troops as well. As a as a singer and piano player, mm-hmm. he picked up boxing while he was in the army. Mm, okay. Um, I watched this documentary about this man. <laughs> uh, I'm only being vague about it because I realize you don't know who I'm talking about yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, but yeah, he he. Here's a quote from from Jay. Uh, After being asked how many people he's killed in a documentary about his life. And this is a, this is a long quote. So we could talk in between here. Like I just didn't, I didn't know how to shorten it and I wanted it to be his words. Uh, So in the second world war, my outfit got ran over by a battalion of Japanese And I was isolated for eight months in one of the Japanese internment camps. And I was a sergeant. And I was a young dude. But I did a lot of killing. I enjoyed it. I didn't have no danger. Um, what? I mean, okay, I can get the, he enjoyed it. I mean, odd, but whatever. But he didn't have no danger? 
I think it's like I didn't have a sense of danger. Oh, okay. but the okay. quote is I I didn't have yeah. no danger. <laughs> right. Okay. I uh, forgot that he skipped school to go fight. <laughs> I mean, harsh, uh, but yeah. <laughs> I figured they're going to kill me. I'm dead, so I killed as many as I can. And it was beautiful to me to be able to take a life knowing I don't have to go to jail. But he's the enemy. If I don't kill him, he'll kill me. So then... I feel like... Okay. All right. All right. All right. I feel like like the last part there is like a, a somewhat more common... Uh, idea to yeah to have that. like that's like, and that's hey. and like sometimes when people are like you know like i don't like the idea of this but i know if i don't kill them they're gonna kill me like it's you know it's it's me or them and that's mm-hmm. like how people cope with killing people and he's just like i finally found an excuse to kill people <laughs> yeah 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 all he's, right he's uh he's he claimed to enjoy it yeah but- yeah. I'm telling you, that's not where the whole story is going. Oh, <laughs> so don't I mean, worry that, too much. That's a lot to that. unpack there, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll, but, I'll be patient. But the uh, but yes, he was asked how many people he's killed, not because this guy's a murderer, but mm. just because he was asked it because they had heard of it. And this is what his reply was, and then so then they caught me, then they caught us, and they overran our camp when we were asleep and the guy says well he's a sergeant i saw his stripes and then he goes well okay we want to know the strength how many people were around and i was like listen let me tell you something i was a, i was raised in america i went to yale i went to yale <laughs> and you know i don't think he went to yale i don't know what mm, he said mm. there because he's talking quickly in this documentary <laughs> mm, mm-hmm. uh and you know asking me questions will get you no answers. Because I am black in America, and they don't even tell me what time the chickens wake up. Mm. Uh, so they put me over here and told me, if I fight, then I die. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So they put me... there. He's talking now, talking about the Japanese soldiers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they put me over here, and they told me, if I fight, then I die, they'd kill me. Now that's, and he's like, now that's it. You got me. Do what you want. You want to talk to me? Kill me. Because I don't know nothing. So he's being pretty antagonist. With yeah, these people he's pretty just much just him. like, I don't <laughs> care what you have to do. You want to kill me? I don't know nothing. I'm, I'm, he kind of like does this weird biography about himself there. And then it's just like, just kill me. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All I want to do is scream you to death. I'm going to make enough noise to drive you crazy, but you might as well kill me. So he's bringing back some opera, uh, some, you know, some traces of his earlier love of music. He's going to. Yeah, yeah. He's going to scream. Like auditory. What's the uh, like sonic weaponry? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a big uh, conspiratorial thing. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, This is where it originated. No. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The government <laughs> was experimenting well... with that early on in the military, so... Yeah, yeah. This is the earliest uh, indication of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you might as well kill me. I'm already killing you, so kill me. You got me. <laughs> so he's yeah. just yeah. taunting them. Yeah. Um, so they turn around. <laughs> so they turn around and beat me for about three months. <laughs> Every I was gonna, morning, I was gonna say like three minutes. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three months. No, let's extend that a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Every morning they stuck knives in my butt, in my thighs. I got knife marks here, 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 under here, and he's pointing all over his body, basically. Uh huh. Uh-huh. And he pointed to above his eyebrow and under his chin. Uh, doctor said, "Damn, you got more scars than you got clothes on." I said, I'm alive. So anyhow, I became a joke. So they said, well, don't bother him. He don't know nothing. So when they caught the American white boys, they got mad because I wasn't being tortured. And Mm. I said I was tortured before you got here, but I don't expect you to believe it. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> he's like, I've already been tortured, but I, I know you're totally not going to accept that. So I'll go ahead and accept whatever you're going to do to me now. Uh, yeah. And they're like, yeah, well, why don't they ask you questions? And they asked me, they asked me everything. They found out nothing. Well, we don't know nothing. <laughs> and then I say, well, you white, so you got to be right. I'm black, so I got to get back. <laughs> and they didn't like it. <laughs> they didn't like making jokes, man. Yeah, yeah. But it's the only way to laugh when you're facing death. Yeah. You got to find something to live and be happy about, or you're dead anyhow. Uh, hmm. So, and there's more of this quote coming. I'm just uh -huh. taking, you know, small breaks to talk about it. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting, though, because if you were a prisoner of war and you were like maybe the lone prisoner of war in a cell or whatever, other dudes coming in the cell and mm -hmm. then people come to torture them, but not you. <laughs> they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, but yeah. And then when they did save us, the guys came in, the paratroopers, 82nd Airborne, came through that. And they liberated us from that camp. So I told them, give me your gun and give me one hand grenade and leave me alone for about one hour. <laughs> they say, what are you going to do? <laughs> I say, I want the captain. And I, so he wants the captain of the internment camp. Right. Basically. The people that are torturing, like, that are holding him captive. He's like, let me talk to who's in charge. Yeah. I'm, okay. And I bust in, and I shot three of his guys before I got to him. Then I tied him up, and I put him in a chair, and he says, What's your problem? We stop bugging you. <laughs> I said, that... What you've done to me, I've got to get even. And I forced the hand grenade in his mouth, taped it around his ears, and then I looked at the door, yanked the pin, ran and leaped out the door, and laid on the ground and watched his whole head disappear. Good gracious. Then I was satisfied. It's okay, we can <laughs> go together on the, the helicopter now, or whatever. Not helicopter, right. I... I couldn't catch the word he was saying there. Yeah. But that's the end of that quote. Yeah. Now, <laughs> that's the end of the whole quote. That yeah, super long quote, but yeah. I didn't want to like try and summarize it because I thought it was interesting how he said it. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. No one tells a story better than than the person himself, and that was a very uh, colorful story. But he, so he shoot. He basically is going deep into the base. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever, yeah. alone or with a guy or something. Yeah. Uh, and he shoots three dudes, and then he gets to the office of the of the captain, uh, and he, he ties him up, tapes a grenade into his mouth, and pulls the pin, uh, and jumps out the door and watches his head explode. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, he loves it. Oh yeah. And. Uh, while he was in the armed forces, <laughs> we're moving, moving right along. <laughs> yeah. While he was in the armed forces, he uh, he also picked up boxing, and he was pretty pretty dang good. He was mm -hmm. so pretty dang good <laughs> that uh, uh, he in 1949 he became the middleweight boxing champion of Alaska. Oh, okay, okay. So, so got a lot of violence, and he's just like, let's just let's keep this going. But during that fight, he did get like badly beaten up. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the championship match, and he decided to stop boxing after that. Um, and uh, in nineteen fifty one, he joined a guitarist named Tiny Grimes. He joined that guy's band, mm -hmm. and he was featured on some of his recordings, and he was, in 1952, he was honorably discharged. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> because he told that story. 
<laughs> I guess. <laughs> of the uh, head explosion. Um, around, so he joined that band in Philadelphia, where he mm-hmm. was the vocalist and keyboard player and chauffeur of this Tiny Grimes guy. Mm-hmm. And he started por- performing solo as well. In like some wild clothes for the for the time like leopard skin red leather crazy mm. hats mm-hmm. and stuff this is like 1952 1953 mm-hmm. 1954 he performed with fats domino became part of his band for a year mm. uh recorded a couple singles as solo artists one of them being a great one called baptize me in wine hmm it's a fun it's a fun song it's good mm-hmm. um but around 1955 to 1956 his girlfriend had left him and she was fed up with him apparently a mm-hmm. uh, quote from him about that is the next day i was sitting at the piano wondering why she left me i didn't want to admit i was wrong and i was tapping on the piano and i said this is so stupid to walk away and leave me like that without giving me a chance to explain. She didn't know she was she's messing with a witch doctor. I'll put a spell on her. Hey. So, screaming Jay Hawkins, <laughs> the writer and recorder and singer of the original song that's on everyone's halloween playlist i yeah. put a spell on you yeah <laughs> what a what a crazy <laughs> life to have up to that point <laughs> yeah what in the world definitely fucking insane uh <laughs> insane intense life uh but what the heck but yeah he recorded it once, and it was more of it was more of a typical proper ballad. Mm-hmm. But uh, a little bit later, not probably like within the year, I believe, he and his band had gotten extremely wasted, really drunk, while recording all night. And Hawkins went fucking insane on this recording (laughs) if you have heard this song which you have yeah yeah if you've been alive for long enough he he one of the to me i love the performance that Mm -hmm. he does on this song Mm -hmm. i put a spell on you yeah because you're my it's so intense and powerful uh he, he, he also hard. does like sort of moans and screams and stuff. Yeah. That are that are like you feel them. Whereas sometimes you hear a song and somebody like moans during the song, and you're like, Ugh, what? No. Um But But yeah. He he had blacked out. He didn't remember recording this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he listened to the recording, and he was like blindsided by it, kind of intimidated by himself singing. Yeah. And he had to relearn the song from the recorded version. <laughs> it was so different. His singing, his screaming, and grunts—it's—it's it's crazy, and it became a hit, not like a Billboard chart hit, not like mm-hmm. number one or something, but it was big. For him, especially. Yeah. He hadn't, you know, he hadn't really done a real, real big record. Yeah. You know, he'd recorded yeah. a couple of things, maybe put out a couple singles on a small label, something like that. But he hadn't really done that. Yeah. yeah. And by this point, he had developed a pretty uh, wild stage per- persona. Mm-hmm. A sort of take on a witch doctor mm-hmm. or a voodoo doctor or whatever. He had a bone through his nose. He had some white face paint. He had a skull named Henry on the end of a stick. Mm-hmm. Sometimes uh, smoking a cigarette, Henry was. Oh. <laughs> Sometimes he'd wear be wearing a loincloth. 
Henry Sometime. or or him? No, no. Henry's a skull. Uh, well, okay, I don't know if it's a skeleton. A I mean, no, no, no. Okay, it's a skull, skull. Gotcha. on a stick. Gotcha. And he would start every show by rising out of a coffin that was oh, brought on stage. That's sick. <laughs> Uh, apparently it was like some manager or something was like, Hey, you should do this. And he was like, no, I don't, I don't really want to do that. And the guy was like, I'll give you $2,000 if you do this. And he was like, all right. <laughs> He's like, all right, and I, then, I do want the 2000. So, and then he stuck with it because it yeah, just it became, was, a it was a good showmanship type right, thing. Right. Right. And he, Scream at Jay Hawkins was an amazing show, but mm-hmm. he was, he was though controversial in his mm. time, mm-hmm. and probably now he yeah. would get canceled or whatever. But right. he was controversial in his time. His music label released a second version of "I Put a Spell on You" without the screams or grunts because they had been getting complaints that they were like overly sexual. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Which I don't know. I've heard the song plenty of times. Right. I don't know that I think of them as super sexual. Yeah. I yeah, se. I wouldn't I wouldn't think of them that way unless like someone really does think of this as some kind of like witchcrafty like w- ritual worship like song or something and they're just like yeah, and it's probably some kind of like twisted satanic orgy going on like behind the scenes or something. I don't know, you know. Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of what like the the issue is that's what his persona kind of was, right? Right, right. It was this sort of big, huge, semi broad but semi specific to like the sort of hoodoo and voodoo uh stuff and yeah. the general idea of witch doctors. <laughs> yeah. And that type of thing. So like not only did it get criticisms from like that, the NAACP thought he kind of made black people look bad. Oh. Um, other black magazines and newspapers also would ignore the existence of Scream and Jay Hawkins for similar reasons. Hmm. Um, quote from Hawkins. I stuck the bone in my nose, put on white shoe polish, combed my hair straight up, got naked with a piece of cloth around my loins, had a spear and shield. So what's wrong with acting like a wild warrior? Mm, The mm -hmm. NAACP and CORE, which is the Congress of Racial Equality, Mm -hmm. didn't like it. Said I was making fun of black people. I said, I'm making a living. I'm not breaking the law. How dare you? Mm. Uh, That's a pretty interesting, like, idea there, like, to discuss. Because if you have, like, I don't know, what were you, you going to say? No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead with what you're saying. Um. So I'm thinking about, like, how how like i don't know how complicated that is because it's like you want to like at that time it's a lot of pressure i'm sure i mean even now to like embrace like european culture and appearance like yes i mean like even a little richard or some of these bigger acts were very like like had very like nice suits very slicked back hair yeah that thing yeah uh whereas he was like uh in the documentary i watched Mm -hmm. uh somebody was saying like there were a lot of acts this is where i'm getting this from there were a lot of acts that were more trying to like blend into the mainstream and be accepted and get their record sold but scream at jay hawkins was one of the acts that was like he was black Mm-hmm. in what he was doing right he was doing a distinctly black thing yeah <laughs> that separated him 
yeah. and categorized him in the black category, not attempting to kind of like merge into it. Not that there's like a right and wrong thing, but he was distinctly uh, doing a more uh, black thing, <laughs> like as a persona, yeah, than like a little Richard. Yeah, yeah. Per se. Like, using, like, like, uh, like black or, like, African uh, cultural iconography. Yeah, specifically with, African. Know. It's like, I'm talking about this. Everybody listening, like, this is the whitest fucking person ever talking about this. Yes, I yes. acknowledge it. I'm going based off of documentaries. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's, like, I'm not an expert on this. Know that I'm not an expert on this. Take yeah. everything I ever say with a grain of salt right uh about anything yeah same, same here <laughs> same here um yeah uh, but i but, yeah, yeah but like and then to complicate that so like you know i mean i mean i know there's a like a movement now to like embrace like you know cultural heritage and like not appropriate cultures and like you know recognize the significance of some of the like imagery um and you know used um, yes and so like at that like he was doing that at that time like i mean i don't know what his like own cultural like it's, history you know ethnic like yeah you know, it's just so. a it's a matter of like i understand both sides very yeah much because yeah. it's like especially at that time oh yeah yeah and that's what i was gonna say like at that like at that time like when yeah it's just like a reminder to like and, are and everybody else is like no, of... no no we're trying to just like di- like a uh, different distance ourselves from that you know like white supremacists right in power were using the idea of like a, a, a black people as savages yeah to push things like segregation and like yeah. keep that yeah. hold, held strong and that type of thing yeah so you i understand that people were like scream at jay shut the fuck up with this bullshit just right. be a singer don't yeah. be yeah. a warrior yeah. you asshole yeah. you're making us look bad but at the same time i'm like he's just a guy trying to do what he wants to do he's yeah. not doing this <laughs> yeah, yeah like he's not he's i mean it's not like obviously like there might be some you know there like there's there may be detriment you know to the movement also, that it's, it's going thing, but but he's also an mind, artist to keep in mind, this isn't like a completely separate persona from himself either. Right, yeah. He yeah. had beliefs uh, that were rooted in sort of hoodoo and voodoo. Yeah. But I, it's hard to like pinpoint where exactly he started like believing these things or even where he got it from because it, it, uh, I, as far as I could tell, it didn't like hoodoo is not a thing that is practiced in uh like native american mm-hmm. they have like shamans and such but right right uh <clears throat> but anyway i want to i want to add one more layer to muddle this a little bit yeah or how like complicated this issue was and slash is like yeah so yeah, like understanding like the context of the culture and political movements happening at that time um and like the pressure he was feeling to just like we like quote unquote blend in um but then at the same time here's somebody who's becoming famous like for embracing that uh and so it's like he's gaining fame or notoriety and moderate success at least at the time for like yeah embracing that culture and so it's like a difficult balance yeah i mean i think i could see somebody saying like because it's so broad the sort of act he's putting on he's putting on like a scary act he's coming Mm -hmm. up out of a coffin you Mm -hmm. know Mm -hmm. and it's like it's easy to demonize. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's more, it's not like it's a perfect representation of hoodoo. Right, Or something right, like right, that. Right. Yeah, it's and there's like, showmanship and, like, like attention. Uh... Yeah, there's plenty of yeah. 
cool like attention grabbing, grabbing stuff yeah. that he does that is like that shock value performances take, and take from you know take and just use to bludgeon like black culture or whatever. right yeah but it has nothing to do with his intentions or his show yeah um it's just people like you know, using... taking things out of context. They're like, yeah, look yeah. at this guy. This is what, yeah. And saying insert rate. I'm not even going to say it because it take a snippet of this. <laughs> yes. And like hear it out of context. No, yeah, I could yeah, definitely see how that could. Yeah. So anyway, there's that. And yeah. So it, yeah, that, that is a huge issue. It is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, where he was and that basically he was <laughs> he was uh in that m- very moment at, at least he was like a successful black artist mm-hmm. he wasn't the most successful at all mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he wasn't close to the most successful but mm-hmm. he was like but black magazines wouldn't cover him because like <laughs> you know the cultural Mm -hmm. cultural impact they're like i don't know if him having a cultural impact is good (laughs) yeah so yeah um like we don't want this to seem like this is a representation of us at the time or you know yeah exactly yeah man but people did freak out about this song um claiming it like evoked cannibalism or any number of horrible things i mean people talked about i mean i know like harry potter and jk rowling is like canceled now but like even before that like it was like can as people hated it for like witchcraft yeah i mean the satanic panic was a huge thing where yeah. people thought that D D caused people yeah. to kill people it was like the new it was like the roll. red scare all over but yeah yeah um or salem witch trials or, i mean all of it before he went on stage as Screamin' Jay Hawkins, he would psych himself up by listening to his favorite records and drinking mm-hmm. to get into his persona. As like a wild man on stage. Mm-hmm. Um, a quote from him, I figured I couldn't sing the song unless I was drunk. Mm. So he was kind of like chasing the recording yeah. of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. because he... He was so taken aback by how wild the recording was. He's like, I didn't even know that was in me type thing. Yeah. (laughs) And then, uh, so he's like, how do I recreate this on stage? People are coming for that song at the very least. So how do I recreate it? Uh, And he would, he'd always perform whole shows full of all sorts of songs. But Obviously, if they're coming for that song, they want more things like that. So how do I get it again? I'm going to drink. <laughs> because mm. that was the different factor on that recording day. Yeah. And there's like that. It's it's interesting, too. Like there are like theories of learning that like explain that as a phenomenon where like if you learn something in an altered state, you remember it better when if you're back in that altered state and like then if mm. you like sober up and then. Um, and then try to do it again or you repeat what you learn or demonstrate what you learn. So that's crazy. I mean, obviously like he did that in an altered state and then tried to like relearn how he sounded on the recording. But like, yeah, that's a pretty weird thing about the human brain. Yeah. And it's not really good that that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not, because it, yeah, because like in his case, it would drive him to drink every show and you know. Yeah. yeah. So, he in the future he would get some record deals but the record company always always was pressuring him to do more novelty mm. style songs mm-hmm. like pigeonholing him putting him into the novelty box yeah and he generally would agree to deliver the novelty songs but he wished the record company and the general public would have the same enthusiasm for his more regular style songs that are ballads or blues and R and B, that type of thing. Mm. Mm-hmm. Rather than his songs such as Constipation Blues and Alligator Wine. Jeez. Uh Constipation Blues is pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty genuinely funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh but uh 
but yeah it it's you know you get pigeonholed as the guy that's like he's the spooky scary guy and he's doing crazy stuff mm-hmm. but he's like i'm actually a singer and i write songs and i like doing it so could i just do that no i'm gonna need you to be crazier yeah um bo diddley famous guitarist huge influence on rock and roll tells a story where apparently screen j was playing a show in the same place after bo diddley was done with the show mm-hmm. so he played the sh- bo diddley plays the show he leaves goes to his hotel the manager calls later and asks if Bo Diddley could play a few more shows because apparently Screamin' Jay's grand spooky entrance where he uh, rises out of the coffin and is wild literally scared people and they ran out of the club. Oh my the majority gosh. of the audience was like screaming and running away <laughs> because... <laughs> His entrance was so wild to them. Wow. So, <laughs> that's a story, random story. Yeah. Um, Jay had apparently not been making money. So, like, some time passes, right? Uh, that happened in... Uh, he releases the song in, uh, I believe, around 1957, mm-hmm. I believe. And some tide passes, right? Right. But he had apparently not been making money from people using his version of his song. Whoa. In 1962, Jay asked for his royalty money from the record company. And apparently was told, black people don't get royalty money. They just take what's given to them without asking. Yikes. And Jay insisted, but at that point, he was told that if he didn't disappear, he was going to get killed. What? As as the record industry was controlled by the mob, that's what Jay claimed, at the very Mm, least. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, he might have misinterpreted something, or maybe something crazy was going on. I mean, either way, like, if that's the... I mean... No denying that at the time, you know, there was injustice happening like that. Uh, I mean, he's not alone in that. So, like, even if even if they're like, well, we didn't threaten to kill him. Like, but if you insinuated or implied something, like, what other legal recourse did he have? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, he moved... That was in 1962, and he moved to Hawaii in 1962. And though, obviously, he would travel a lot for Mm -hmm. his own career. Mm -hmm. And as years went by, his popularity in America faded. Uh, But in Europe and Japan, he was quite popular. Mm -hmm. A quote from him uh, about uh, Europe. They like anyone who sings the blues. Plus, I'm colorful. You must remember, they're the ones who discovered Frankenstein, Dracula, and the Wolf Man. So when I come over there, with a bone in my nose and Henry the Skull, I'm right at home among amongst the ghoul mongers. Hmm. 1974, he quits drinking and found that he could sing I Put a Spell on You just as well as when he was sober. Hey, nice. Uh... He opens for the Rolling Stones at Madison Square Garden in 1980. But they did make sure to note that he had to do all his scary shtick, which he wasn't in love with at the Mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. A few years later, he was talking to an interviewer. He says, uh, I mean, I've got a voice. Why can't people just take me as a regular singer Mm -hmm. without Mm -hmm. making a boogeyman out of me? Yeah. I come along and get a little weird, and all of a sudden I'm a monster or something. People won't listen to me as a singer. I'm some kind of monster. I don't want to be a black Vincent Price. I'm sick of it. I hate it. I want to do goddamn opera. I want to sing. I want to do Figaro. I want to do Ave Maria, the Lord's Prayer. I want to do real singing. I'm sick of being a monster. That's but that's understandable, and like 
but that's so that's i want to i want to talk about can i, I want to interject uh, another yeah. complication issue here that like obviously at the time with like race and like you know he's like you he's like not getting paid what he's owed um i mean they don't even think they owe him anything because they they're, they're so like callously yeah. you know regard black lives but um at the same time like you have a label you know like he's his i mean i don't know the intricacies of it but like the label's like all right like we we will produce this for you but you have to have some kind of you know some of your shtick songs on here or whatever like you know you gotta produce something that meeting our criteria uh like what we think is gonna sell um yeah and so like and that's where like i never really understood like the like indie label type stuff until like i mean now that i'm older because i was like yeah i mean somebody's gonna like produce your stuff for you that's cool but i'm like no you're especially i mean i've like things with taylor swift and kesha and britney spears like all that you know, that has like brought light to things but like sure you like in a sense so i mean it, it's such a juxtaposition between like a job and art so if you have like a singer or a songwriter or a musician that's like an artist and they're doing it like as expression or you know because they feel it and it's a passion and then like they quote unquote get a job with this label and the their employer is like no you do it the way we tell you to do it and like what a stifling experience but at the same time like like you accepted this as a job and so like you have to fulfill your contract which but you know it's just like i mean especially for younger artists it's like you can just get like trapped in it because you don't know any better or you know you're at a young age and you're yeah. naive and so like it's on one hand it's like well you they are giving you a job and so you have to do that job but then also if there was like if you were hoodwinked or whatever the term i don't know what the term yeah you signed you tricked a contract into it, like, that uh, had a lot of small yeah. text that was hard to read yeah so i mean on one hand i understand if a label is like we will pick you up but this is what we want to be able to produce so you have to meet this criteria and like i think that's a valid thing if they're like we're, we're you're you're an employee basically we're hiring you for this if you want this or yes or no but on the other hand like, well if that means they can't get a job or if it's you know if it's like if it becomes too encroaching like i understand the con the the, uh, the converse of that of like no it's like artistic freedom and this is my art and i don't like it's yeah it's hard to like make a living while also maintaining freedom of art yeah and apparently expression. he was also going to like he wanted to like record opera as well but nobody gave him oh any yeah kind of deal yeah with that. if he's like a um, hit you know like pop i mean popular at the time um well actually at this time he wasn't as popular oh, but okay yes. okay well yeah if they're like thinking they can make anything of him and make or make any money off of him they're gonna not gonna let him do something that they don't think is gonna sell yes which absolutely. is which is like which sucks yeah yeah. Uh, he's also in this quote complaining about like just sort of the he was almost instantly pigeonholed yeah. as this guy. Yeah, he did create the persona; it was his thing. Yeah, uh, and you know, for the majority of his career, he performed pretty much in that persona. Mm -hmm. uh, either more into the persona or more a regular singer, but he still like got the persona's vibe a little. Mm -hmm. Um, but still, you know, even though he created it, it's still like, I just want to be a singer. Yeah. It's if you're, if you're forced to do it all the time, you're like, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah. Um, or if it's like a way to get attention at first and then you're like, but look, I also can write normal music or perform normally. Like you know, if you do <laughs> yeah, it, do it to bring awareness to something. That's one thing. And then you're like, all right, now, now you, you're a fan. I uh, hear some other good music too. You know, yeah but it's that's crazy i mean i know like i don't i don't know the whole the, all the details of it yet or how it's gonna apply but i know like twitch is issuing or has i think it's like they're working on a thing for like um that's gonna keep up with like it's gonna keep track with keep track of basically like how brand accessible you are so Ugh. like i mean there's gonna be things for like how much you engage with chat the types of games you play and like the ratings for the like if you're you know the ratings of games that you play and how in demand that is 
um, how many yeah. viewers, stuff like that. But I'm sure some of it has to is going to do with like persona or theme because it's a very very big thing on Twitch. Um, sure. And so, I mean, as, yeah, as you know, <laughs> um, and so like yeah, it makes me think like you're you kind of get forced in into this i mean but uh, i also see how like the record of a record label or a producer is like if i'm gonna produce something i I, (laughs) you can't just like agree to produce something for an artist and the artist just comes out with a whole album like full of like racism and you're like well i said i was gonna produce it like i mean they have to have some say over what happens you know because it's like their Mm -hmm. reputation is on the line too so it's, you're yeah. saying that's a non sequitur. You're not saying what Scream and Jay does. No, does no, 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 yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, I'm just thinking, yes, yeah, exactly. I'm thinking just like, I'm just thinking more of like generalizing this just to the issue of like artist versus label and how yeah. like it's not as black and white, mm-hmm. of, you know, where it's just like, well, the, there are the artists should be able to do what they want. I mean, like, yeah, they can, but if they're going to do it with a label, like they might have to be, uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah, 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 no, it is. So it is a consistent it's struggle. So crazy to think about all this. Um, so in uh, he also felt that like pieces of his act were stolen, mm, mm-hmm. and then people that stole this individual piece would have huge success, would go on to huge success, whereas he was not successful. He was a little resentful yeah. of his position, yeah, in the music industry, yeah. Um, and a, uh, in 1984, a guitarist from small band, uh, and I believe founder of a small label goes to a ribs restaurant to eat in New York. There was like 30 people there. And this guitarist saw that screaming Jay Hawkins was just playing there with a piano. Mm. Like, uh, like he, it was just like, he was the lounge singer. Mm-hmm. And he was getting harassed by the manager, Screaming Jay was, of the place. That was giving him order, orders, when to stop and start and play and what to play. And this guy felt like Screaming Jay Hawkins deserved more. Mm-hmm. And he talks to Screaming Jay after the show. A few nights in a row. And the third night, he brought up that, hey, I'm in a band. I have a small label. It's not much. But uh, if you're interested in having a backing band or whatever... Mm-hmm. Or, maybe recording and the first thing after uh, out of screen with jay's mouth was uh i don't like white people <laughs> to which the guitarist responded well jay i don't like any people <laughs> and that broke the ice and that led to jay having a band again wow i mean but that's jay a, fell that's upon a hard assessment. times based on his experiences <laughs> and yeah <laughs> yeah, I don't like white people, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Jay fell upon pretty pretty hard times. Yeah. Uh, you know, because he wasn't even getting paid for the for his recording. He got paid, yeah. I believe, uh, he got paid for people, people covering his song. Mm. Got some royalties for that. Yeah. But his recording, his famous recording, was not, he did mm. not get paid for it. Which is crazy. So, in 1984, that same year, uh, director Jim Jarmusch put uh, I Put a Spell on You, his recording, in a prominent part of his movie, Stranger Than Paradise. This is an indie director, indie film, uh, and it sparked a lot of new interest in Scream and Jay, which mm-hmm. allowed Scream and Jay to, re- to tour the U.S. regularly which he hadn't uh, in recent years. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jim Jarmusch wanted to find Screamin' Jay himself in order to get his blessing for his use in the song and make sure that he got paid. Mm -hmm. Uh, But Jay was hard to find. Apparently he was living in a trailer in New Jersey and he didn't have a phone. Mm. Uh but yeah, 1990, Jim Jarmusch, that director, yeah. cast Screamin' Jay Hawkins in his movie Mystery Train as a manager of a seedy hotel. He worked, Screamin' Jay worked with two, sorry if I'm just 
keep on talking. You can. No, but, you, I'm listening. I'm, I'm enraptured. I was just thinking okay. about how, like, I was going to throw off on New Jersey about, like, out of all the bad things that happened to Screaming Jay, like, at, towards, like, in this state, I was like, oh, man, and he had to live in New Jersey. But I decided. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I decided Number one fruit, worst thing. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I decided yeah. I was going to keep my mouth shut about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm glad I gave you that opportunity to take that swipe. Yeah, thanks. But thanks. He, he, he worked with uh, two young Asian actors, and he pulled Jim Jarmusch's side, and he said, I've got a problem. I've got too much bad memory. I'm trying to get over it. It's not rational. I don't dislike these two people, but I'm afraid of them. They make mm. me nervous. Because mm. of experience his experience yeah. in the war. Yeah. He was a prisoner. Right. Imprisoned by uh, Japanese soldiers. Uh, and Jim Jarmusch talked to the two young Asian actors, told them about Jay's life. Uh, and they were kind of in awe of him in general anyway. And they got them to spend time together and Jay relaxed around them. Mm. And uh, Jim Jarmusch says in this uh, documentary, uh, he then says, like, later on, Jay did have a Japanese wife. Oh, wow. And he, he did, he's like, it probably wouldn't have happened if he hadn't had this, been, like, forced to work with these people on this movie and gotten along with them. Yeah. Uh, and people liked him a lot in this role. He got a couple more movie roles. And plenty of movies, of course, used I Put a Spell on You in them. Yeah. But you know how much he got paid for that. Yeah. Um, so Screamin' Jay died in 2000, mm -hmm. the year 2000. And he had an aneurysm. 70 years old. In the documentary I watched, Though he still wanted to be like an opera singer more than anything, this was documentary was made in like ninety nine, like mm -hmm. a year before. Yeah. Uh he seemed to be generally like happy mm -hmm. where he was. Good. In his career and his yeah. life. Like he wanted more, but he he wasn't he was kind of accepting, seemingly, yeah. Of his position. Uh throughout his life, Screaming Jay Hawkins had fathered over 57 children. Oof. Different girlfriends, groupies, etc. Genghis Khan right there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> probably much less uh, horrific yeah, yeah. <laughs> situation than that. But yes, I understand what you're saying. In, his in terms years, of the offspring, not in terms of the way he... He copulated. Yeah. Uh, in his later years, he regretted dedicating so much time uh, to his career over getting to know his many children, mm -hmm. who they were, where they, where they were, how they were, etc. Uh, so not long after Jay died, his friend and uh, biographer, Moral Nagolian, set up a website called Jay's Kids. And the website was uh, made to find and unite his kids, mm -hmm. saying that it was Jay's final request. And it got a lot of attention. ABC News did a story on it. And they got tons of submissions of people basically being like, well, I don't know, but this, this, and this. Or, or people saying, I know that I'm, the, I'm a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... They had to sift through all of those submissions and try to get information to confirm that they were, in fact, Jay's kids. And so they did. And in early 2001, 33 of Jay's kids were identified and invited to a reunion in Los Angeles. 12 showed up and, quote unquote, reunited. But I imagine plenty of them did not meet before ever. So, yeah, united. Wow. So, that is pretty much the story. I have some other things here. Yeah. I mean, that's a really long story. I understand. I'm sorry, and you're welcome. No, that was very interesting. But, <laughs> uh, you know what? We'll do a collateral damage episode All right. for these random facts. Okay. Uh, 
that are just it's just kind of like i didn't know where to put them in the story Mm -hmm. yeah so all right oh wait i gotta i gotta do this one okay uh he had at one point he had a wife he's he had uh i believe he had six wives (laughs) like total or at the Uh, same time not at the same time okay okay his wife, Pat, who was also a singer, mm-hmm. but his wife, Pat, would very regularly bring home another woman to have threesomes with him. Mm. This was like one of his middle wives. Yeah. <laughs> this was yeah. not his last wife or whatever. Um, but at a certain point, his wife brought home a girl, would bring home a girl that only she wanted to sleep with exclusively. Oh, Screen of Jay wasn't into that. So he makes a move on this girl. And uh, apparently his wife, Pat, got out a thirty two pistol, shot him three times. Jeez. He fell down. She pulls out a knife and starts cutting him, like, across his waist. Gracious. And then, according to him, I chased the bitch for three and a half blocks before I passed out. She's as crazy as he is. <laughs> like she's they're already he's she's so she's okay with him uh you know having others and the, but then she's like but this one's mine. But but it's like a threesome situation yeah. that she's okay with. Right. And then now she's like no, just us two. Like not us, but like me and her. And and he's like, "What?" Yeah, he was like he and he tried to just get with the girl right that was not Pat. okay so that's okay and that's then, a little bit more understandable for her outrage because she's like for it's her okay outrage, yes. it's okay if you're i mean you know still not okay to shoot and stab somebody but like i if she's you know I, I guess i could see how if it's just like all right you and like us plus one more or me and you but then you're like you and someone else no no no, 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 no. she said she said us plus one more but now i'm bringing home this girl and now it's just me and her Mm. Okay, so what's... and then he was like, "You know what? How about me and her? Just me and her for a little a bit of action." Uh-huh. And then his wife was like, "How about a uh, three bullets in your stomach?" <laughs> so I, I wonder if it was if she was jealous there because I mean she could be like jealous on two fronts there. Like she could be jealous that her husband wants to fool around with somebody else without her. She could also be jealous that the girl that she likes would is her husband's making moves on her so she could be jealous of both people in this scenario sure uh yeah yeah. and then one last thing that i just want to mention it's not really a story it's just like scream and jay kind of brought uh he brought like a certain type of showmanship into music that Mm -hmm. wasn't there before yeah like shock rock is a thing alice cooper i was gonna say alice cooper is who i think of yeah uh kiss even someone like marilyn manson oh yeah is like yeah a more modern like shock thing he actually did a recorder uh i mean he's a piece of shit oh yeah yeah <laughs> but big time. Big time. he he also covered i put a spell on you at some point i think yeah uh but like at least screaming jay got money for that or would have gotten money for that one if it was yeah really he would have gotten that yeah uh but but my point is like he he actually did influence a lot oh yeah with... yeah yeah and he was an amazing singer i i implore anybody to uh listen to uh well listen to i put a spell on you again because right appreciate like, that appreciate it because it's usually just a song it's like oh it's wild it's crazy no like listen to it just as a song mm-hmm. <laughs> don't think of it in association with halloween right and the performance blows me away and then another yeah, the song emotion and raw. Yeah. 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 The emotion behind the it. Sensuality exactly. of the moans. <laughs> yeah. How how turned on I get when I hear those <laughs> moans. Uh but then there's also another song that's kind of uh you could say it's cheesy, but it's it's called Portrait of a Man. And it's about a guy painting a portrait. Uh and it's sort of like a dreary, sad portrait. Mm. Uh, and 
the twist of the song is that he's painting a picture of himself. Uh, uh, sorry to spoil the three minute song for yeah, you, but, geez. uh, but it's really well sung. It's really, uh, it's really wonderful. And with that, uh, we're going to go to a break, right? Right. <laughs> so we'll be right back right after this. But they would not be right back at all, for they went too long. So Mystic will fight back on the next episode. Stay tuned, folks. 